No reclame de hoje, a gente vai saber o que a roqueira Pat Smith foi fazer no Festival de Cannes desse ano. Hora da gente curtir o nosso diário Cannes Lions 2011. Sexta-feira começa agitada, com o shortlist das categorias mais aguardadas. Filme, filme craft, titânio, entre Great Lions. O Brasil tem 14 trabalhos no shortlist de filme, um no shortlist de filme craft e, infelizmente, não tem nenhum na categoria titânio e Integrated Lions. Aliás, o Brasil ainda não conseguiu acertar a mão nesta categoria. Hoje é dia também da palestra da roqueira Pat Smith. O auditório estava lotado. Pat Smith declarou que não gosta de ser bombardeada por propaganda, mas que uma boa ideia pode ser capaz, sim, de chamar a sua atenção. I mean, for me, I was just this skinny kid from New Jersey. I didn't think I was as special or any more special than anyone else. Why fate left it to me, I don't know. E logo depois do seminário, ela concedeu uma coletiva para a imprensa. Well, uh, the first question is what do I think about the uh, uh, the Cannes Lions Fest, Cannes Lions Festival, and what do I know about it? Truthfully, I didn't know much about it. Why did I come? Because I love the opportunity to come to places and talk to the people. I love doing this, you know. Of course, you know, I have a job and I am paid and that's great. I'm happy to be paid and to communicate with people. But this is not a job. I am just here and I'm happy. I'm always happy when we can communicate more intimately. Because sometimes in a concert, it's not, you know, so easy, especially a huge festival, to have such uh, direct contact with people. Uh, Brazil, I um, have played once in Brazil. I don't, I can't talk about so much Brazilian culture, but the people are fantastic with so much energy. And uh, my feelings about Brazil personally is that I'm always praying that for the environment in Brazil. So important to the world that somehow we all help Brazil maintain its environment. So, um, sorry, that's all I can tell you right now. Durante o Festival de Cannes, é possível a gente encontrar os grandes nomes da propaganda mundial. E a gente pediu para o nosso colunista Pedro Cabral entrevistar para o reclame o Chuck Porter. Ele é sócio da premiadíssima agência americana Crispin Porter mais Boguski. Olá, meus amigos do Brasil, do Reclame. Estou aqui hoje com... One of the most famous men of advertising in the world, Chuck Porter. Let me ask you something that in intrigues a lot of people. Why did you and your team, you decided to do something really different from everybody else about Five, six years ago, uh, I'm not sure, Christian Potter and Boguski became the agents that were doing really uh, integration and a lot of online. How did you get to that? I don't think that we ever sort of had like a big master plan that says we're going to become very digital. What happened yesterday doesn't matter. What happens tomorrow, we don't know. Come in today and do something great. And as as interactive and digital became more and more a part of people's lives, more and more of what we were doing was there because that was the smartest thing to do today. Not for tomorrow, but right now. This is where people are, and as we saw, more and more people were going online, and, and you know, back in about, in about 2004, the line crossed between, for young men, between the time, amount of time they spent online and the time they spent watching TV. All of a sudden, they spent more time online. 
So we looked at that and said, okay, the smartest thing for us to do right now is be online, be where they are. And so it sort of evolved that way. It wasn't, it wasn't because we said this is the future, it's because we said this is now. So we did it now. People told me that in your agents you have some style to work, some special future that when you create a, a campaign, you like give the brief for several different teams and they like compete between each other to see who brings the best ideas and everything integrated from film to uh, digital, print, well, so how this works in, in, in CPMB? Well, you know, we don't really, we don't necessarily have teams competing. We have, typically we have a lot of teams working on a project and we use a lot of ideas because we, we believe in doing a lot of stuff. We believe people get bored and so we believe that, that we need to keep advertising very fresh, which means new creative. So, so we use it all, but, but I think that we never start whether it's a campaign or we just begin working on a brand or whatever, we never start with advertising. We start with like, what is the best idea to tell this brand story? And so we start with the idea and sometimes it's an event or a press release or, and sometimes it involves advertising, but it doesn't start with advertising. It starts with what, what's the best idea for this brand. So I think that that's why we, we tend to do a lot of stuff outside of traditional advertising. I heard once from, well, uh, important people of advertising in Brazil that, well, uh, if it was not uh, the kind of work that you do, there would not be the Titanium here in Kent. They needed to create a different category to, well, to, well, put your work into that. And, well, it, it became a huge influence for advertising all over the world. You have been uh, the, the, the president of the jury of Titanium. What do you think that, uh, this integration means to advertise as a whole in the world today? I don't want to make any big proclamations. I think it's very simple. I think that, that most marketers have to look at how, what is the smartest thing for their brand to do? I think there's such a huge array of opportunities and avenues for brands to reach people if their story is good enough that, that they have to think in a very, very broad way about it. And people don't, people don't consume media one at a time. In other words, people don't say, okay, now I'm gonna watch TV, okay, now I'm gonna go online, okay, now I'm gonna look at a newspaper. It's all a continuum, so, so I think you need to use all of those avenues, or, and so that's kind of the way we think about it, but I think a lot of advertisers are, are beginning to understand that. Difficult, because a lot of the stuff we do is hard to measure, um, and that, that's our next step, is trying to figure out how to get, like, analytics based on everything we do. I know that you still love to, to do some films, TV films, yeah. you told me once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think that broadcast TV, the way the model it is, is gonna die? We are going to have something like just TV on demand, movies on demand, video on demand, and the broadcast channels they're going to be less important in the future or they're going to just disappear? I don't think that they'll go away because, I mean, the evidence is that people don't really hate advertising and people are not necessarily willing to pay extra money to not have advertising. When HBO first started, you know, people signed up for HBO and HBO's story, HBO in the U.S., and their story was, we don't have any advertising. And they got a lot of people signing up when they had great content, when they had the Sopranos, that's when everybody signed up because people love content. I think maybe there will be a model in the future where people will choose what advertising they want to look at. So if there's going to be a Super Bowl broadcast, they can say, okay, I, I, w I want to see ads from Nike, or I want to see ads from Chevrolet, or I want to see ads from Budweiser. They'll decide which advertising they're willing to put up with. I think that could happen. Okay, thanks a lot. Pedro, sir. this was terrific. Okay, Thank you very great. much.